Hello, 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 and welcome to Believe. That's B-L-E-A-V in Lions, right here on the Believe Network. As always, I'm your host at Javanaugh87, Jack Kavanaugh. And as always, I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend, the all-pro, the interception leader, the Detroit Lions superstar safety, Glover Quinn Jr. What is up, man? You know, just loving life. We're getting lots of peaks at the Lions. It's still beautiful weather. Football's ramping up. It is truly one of the best times of the year, this little August that we've got here. It is, you know, it's a lot going on. It feels it feels like, you know, I know I know the new year is in January, but like this feels like the start of the new year. School starting back. You know, football is starting back. So, you know, once football starts, then you're going to be into that season. Then you're going to get into basketball season. You're going to have the World Series. So it's just just a lot of stuff going on right now. So the uh, the activity feels like it's right. And it's a great time of year. It really is. And adding to that great time of year for you, you just got from back from New Mexico visiting your old team, the Lobos. How was that? What did you see? And what does it feel like visiting your old college versus your old NFL team versus your old JUCO team? <laughs> Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball. NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50 to receive 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. That's B L E A V 50. Bet online where the game starts. <laughs> so, yes, I did. I, I, I traveled to check out all those teams. And, you know, it was my first time getting back to New Mexico to go to a football practice. You know, I've been back and, you know, quick visits here and there. Um, but it was my first time actually going to a football practice and what's funny is so the staff that was there when I when I played there, they're actually back in a little similar, different. So the head coach when I was there is not a D coordinator and okay. the safeties coach when I was there is not a head coach. So the, the safeties coach got the job and then he brought back uh, Coach Long as his defensive coordinator. So it was good to get back and see those guys. A couple guys that I played with are helping out with the team. Um, so it was good to see those guys. And then my nephew actually plays for the team. He got a scholarship offer to go out there and play. So that was big time. It was good to go out there and check him out, see what they're doing. And, you know, just kind of show your face around the building. You know, I remember playing there and, you know, Brian Erlacher came in before we played a game. Um, so I was able to see him, you know, um, couple other players that had, you know, got opportunity to play in the pros, they came back. So it's always good to to see that, especially for those seniors that, you know, are going are going into their last year and hoping to get a shot to uh to play in the NFL. So having NFL pro guys come back and be able to talk to you guys and answer some questions, it's always super cool, man. And so it just felt good to to go back and 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 show your face and and be around the guys. And then, you know, it's a little different, though, when you go back to the NFL. You know, it feels the same as far as the love that you feel from people um, that maybe you impacted while you were there. You know what I'm saying? Um, the, 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 the treatment and the people in New Mexico were awesome. The treatment and the people in, in Detroit, you know, was, was awesome as well. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, one of them is college. One of them is professional football. And you know, when you can make an impact in, in, in places that you've been and, and people really, 
you know, feel good about you. You know, you 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 smile a little bit, and that's how it's been for me these last couple of weeks. You know, and then obviously going back to my JUCO, uh, the same thing. You know, and just talking with those guys because everybody's at different levels, right? You know, you're at JUCO. You know, you're trying to you're trying to do what you can to get that next scholarship, whether it be D1, D2, D1, AA, whatever it is. You're just trying to get that next opportunity to continue playing. Right. But then you go to the NF. I mean, you go to college to D1 or whatever. You're trying to do the same thing. Right. You're trying to do everything you can to give yourself that best opportunity to get a shot to keep playing. Right. And then when you go to the NFL, you're doing the same exact thing. No, you're not trying to go to a higher level, but you're trying to do everything you can to stay there so you can continue to play because they're constantly bringing new guys in. So each level, you know, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're working your butt off. You're working as hard as you can to try to continue playing this game as long as you can. And whatever level you're at, you never can lose focus of that. You never can get that chip off your shoulder because the minute that you do, it could be over. And it's so cool for you to have been to all of the places that you cut your teeth at. And I'm glad that it felt like home while you were there and that you were so well received by the fans, by the team and everything. I've got to ask about your trip to New Mexico, though. First, what position does your nephew play? And second, with the safeties coach moving to head coach, I assume that you had a pretty good relationship with him and he helped your development at New Mexico. So my nephew actually is playing. Um, he's actually playing safety. I think they recruited him. Nice. As a corner. I think they recruited him as a corner, but I think he's going to play safety. You know, he's actually, he's an athlete. He could play safety corner receiver offense. He can, he's he got can the play. genes for it. Clearly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we play ball. Um, but for me, you know, I actually, so when I was in college, I played corner. So, the coach that really coached me and helped me was Coach Reffitt, right? Uh, he's and he's still the corners coach there. He had left when the other coaches left, and he was at you know Louisiana Monroe and things like that. But, it, but when Coach G came back, he brought he brought all the guys back. So he brought Coach Ref back, he brought Coach Long back, he brought Coach Lenz back, brought a lot of the guys back that that were there when I was there. So um i did work with coach g when i was there because he was obviously when you're a db coach you know there's times where you're coaching the corner there's times where you're coaching the safeties and you know we're all kind of intermingled in, in in the mix depending on the drill and the situation that we're that we're working on um but for him to get the head coaching job you know he went he left new mexico he went on and he he coached at different schools he was a head coach out of uh he was a coach out of arizona state um and he just kind of worked his way up man just worked hard worked his way up and you know opportunity came open back at the university of new mexico and he's a homegrown kid and you know played for the lobos and you know it was just a perfect fit and so when he came back it was it was it, it all laid out for him to to bring back the guys and try to get that program back to where it was um you know early in the 2000s you know i mean i think I think he said yesterday that from maybe 2000 to 2007 or two, something like that, you know, the Lobos was was the only team in the Mountain West Conference that was bowl eligible every single year. And at that point, you had the BYUs, the Utahs, the TCUs. I mean, you had those schools in the conference and for New Mexico to be the only school that was bowl eligible every year. That means you're winning six plus games every single year. Um, that was big time. So we're just trying to get the program back there. And I think they got the right guys to, uh, to, to make it happen. That's very exciting for fans of the Lobos to hear. We love a story of a homegrown coach, homegrown talent returning back to where he cut his teeth. And I think a lot of Lions fans is, are hoping that will ultimately happen. You, should you decide to enter the coaching ranks, maybe return to Detroit. You know, it if it if it works out that way, you know, it, it would be an honor, you know, to to coach for one in the NFL, um, to coach for a team that you played for that 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 did a lot for you in in, in your career. Um, like I said, I got a lot of love for Detroit, you know. 
they they took me in. So I I do have a lot of love for Detroit, but you know a lot of things will have to happen, and you know I know I can do it. I I mean I I have no doubt in my mind that I could be a coach. I mean I I love the game. I understand the game. I can teach the game. Um, I can develop. I I can I can do those things. I know I can. Um, but you know, right now it's just just so hard for me to leave my kids. You know, I, it's, coaching takes so much time, especially when you really want to be great at it. It just takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of mental capacity because you're thinking about every single thing. You're thinking about every single kid or person or outdoor or whatever that you got to try to get to make this play, to understand this this play. To to what? So it just takes a lot of time. And maybe I'll stay around the game long enough, continue just helping out, you know, filling in where I can fill in. And when when the stars align and the pieces align how they should, maybe I will enter the coaching ranks. And we'll be keeping an eye on that. We'll be following, supporting the entire journey. But in the meantime, putting on your scouting glasses for a moment – what did you think of the first preseason game of the Lions? Because they did lose 27-23, but uh, what do players feel about preseason scores? Is that kind of something that goes off to the wayside and it's more about executing on your individual tasks? Well, the, the thing the thing that I want to say is you always want to practice winning, right? You, regardless. As you go out to play, you want to practice winning. First team, second team, third team, doesn't really matter. You want to get in the habit of winning, right? Winners win. So you want to get in the habit of learning how to win. However, you look at the game, I thought the one offense came out and they looked sharp. You know, they 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 looked sharp. They had one drive. They went all the way down the field, capped it off with a touchdown, wide receivers making plays. Running backs making plays, running backs, Jamal running hard, DeAndre Swift running hard, Jared Goff making throws. I mean, those, those they look good. The offensive line, I told you those guys were dominant. They looked they dominant. They were moving they, people. They, I mean, they I mean, you invested in the trenches and you got you 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 got what a glimpse of what it can be, right? Barring everybody staying healthy and and things going the right way. So I thought the offense looked Really, 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 really good. You know, I would have liked to have seen more. Um, like, it would have been good if they would have came out defensively and got a stop. You know, Aiden Hutchinson looked good. Um, you know, nice big, uh, you know, TFL. And that's always good for a rookie, a young guy, home home guy. So he's probably got a lot of nerves, a lot of anxiety. Well, not anxiety, but just excitement to be playing in forward field that's your home team you're the home guy even though it's a preseason game you know i remember you know ziggy's first year in in uh detroit you know we're playing our first preseason game against the jets and ziggy jumps up and i think he caught an interception and took it back for a touchdown or made some type of big play off off a screen or something like that and so it's just good for those guys to come in with high expectations and to deliver in such short time, right? They only played 11 plays or so. And that's that's the thing, right? When you look at the defense, you look at your starters, they only went one series, I think it was, and they got 11 plays. So you don't want to be having these 11 play drives. That means, you know, they got multiple first downs to get 11 plays in. So for your offense to come out and drive it right down the field and score a touchdown, you can't you can't let the other team come right back and do the same thing. You got to take that field and come out and get a stop. You know what I'm saying? I thought the safeties looked real active. Um, and what I saw, Tracy Walker was in there, you know, getting physical. Uh Deshaun Elliott made a couple of nice tackles uh in the open field. You don't you really don't want to have to major and making open field tackles like that, but he did a good job of doing that. Um, you know. Still want to see, like I say, still want to see, you know, guys make plays in at, at the at the corner position, right? We can't, you know, just 
you just want to see guys making plays, right? As, as DBs, you want to make plays. Corners, you want to make plays. Less tackles as corners, right? You want to be getting your hands on the ball, knocking the ball down, intercepting the ball, doing things like that, right? Um, thought the linebackers looked pretty solid, you know? Okay, for for what it was. Like I said, I, I don't like the fact that they just they let them go right back down the field. And I think they scored a touchdown, if I'm not mistaken, right? They did. Um, so you just don't want that. You don't you don't want that to happen. You don't want them to, to allow them to come right back and answer, especially when you're at home, you got all the momentum. Like that that should have been first group come out, go right down the field and score. We come out, we go three and out, or if at worst we give up a first down and they and then they're not now they're punting and it's a great day, right? So for that to happen and then for, you know, you go through the game, you know, a couple young DBs made some nice plays, you know, got an interception in there. Um, you know, still still want to see a little more, right? And then obviously at the end of the game, you got to find a way to, to close the game out, right? Drop interception, a miss interception, whatever it is, you got to find ways to, to, to help close the game out because, you know, you give teams – more opportunities they're gonna they're gonna cash in and then you end up losing the game 27 23 and what could have been a great night still was an okay night but it could have been better with a win it's all it's a whole lot easier to correct things when you win you know what i'm saying when you lose now you got to find out all the little things and talk about all the little things that cause you to lose that game right when you find ways to win you become in the habit and you practice winning and it just raises the spirits everyone's happier and makes you believe just a little bit more i'm sure and you touched on a lot of the things i noticed in that preseason game too number one offensive line just moving bodies number two Aiden Hutchinson coming right out the gate and making plays. He was PFF's highest graded first round rookie defender in week one of the preseason for what it's worth. Still nice to see him beat a veteran tackle, a pro bowler in Jake Matthews, regardless of how you feel about the grading systems. And the other thing I noticed real early in the game was actually on special teams because the very first kickoff, the very first tackle of the Detroit Lions season was made by a guy we've been hearing about all spring, all summer. And then for Malcolm Rodriguez to go and make that first tackle. And then we see on hard knocks, the linebackers coach, Kelvin Shepard saying, why is it the rookie that is making all the good plays? Why is the rookie the one doing what he was coached to do? I'm going to have to start putting him with the first team if you guys can't do your job. And it was no disrespect, but more shock that it's the rookie acting like the veteran in terms of what he's being coached to do. Well, you get that a lot of times. You know, I was a rookie that came in and that's that's what you get because rookies are young, right? They're 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 like babies, right? So mm. everything that they know, you're teaching them. Sometimes you get veterans and maybe they learn something somewhere else or maybe they've done it certain ways other places or they feel like you can do things differently. So now when you're telling them to do stuff, you might get a little kickback because they may feel like I can do it this way because I've been successful doing it this way. So naturally, I want to do it my way, but sometimes your way doesn't work, right? But when you get rookies come in, they got a clean, clean slate. So anything you teach them, that's all they know. So a lot of times you get these rookies that are hardworking guys that can come in and they do what the coach say. And when you make plays doing what the coach is saying, it always sticks out, right? Because when you don't make plays not doing what the coach asks you to do, it stands out as well, right? So I was one of those guys that, you know, I did the techniques that the coach, you know, taught us the way he trained us to do it. And... I would make play is doing it. But then you will have some veteran DBs that be like, man, I don't want to do that. Like, I ain't, we haven't been doing it. I haven't done it my whole career. Like, I don't want to do that. And then when they don't make plays, now it's just kind of like, well, maybe you should do what he's doing, right? 
And so you have that. And, and I never feel like it's too early to be a baller, right? You don't have to be a four-year guy to be a baller. I mean, who says you can't come in as a rookie and be a baller? It's just football. If you understand the game, you know how to play, you listen to the coaches, you understand the system, and you just play hard and make plays. Like I said, I've done it. I started 13, 12 games as a rookie, right? So it happens. It can happen. And from what you see, his name has been hot all offseason. It's been hot during camp. Comes out the first play of special teams and shows that it ain't just practice. This is real. I'm big time. I got nothing against it. Rookie, vet. If you big time, you big time. Let's go play. And so it doesn't matter if you're a rookie. It doesn't matter if you're a vet. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. If you can play, you can play. And he's showing that it's not just practice. It's, this is this is real life. And this is this is who I am. And that's got to be exciting for all Lions fans out there with how well last year's rookie draft class played and how much hype we're getting. Because you obviously can't say these guys are stars. These guys are living up to the expectations. But for the early returns, two years in a row to be pretty positive, that's an exciting feeling for a team that has been kind of struggling to keep the stars that they develop because a lot of the time the lions will have good players and then they'll go for a second contract somewhere else. And one of the things I noticed too was unfortunately it is cut down day. The last two days going from 90 man roster to the 85 man roster. And the Steelers actually claimed one of the lions cuts in center Ryan McCollum. So I don't think that's been the case much lately with teams picking up players that the Lions have released. So that's another exciting thing in terms of the overall talent on this roster. But I do want to know with cutdown day, what's the atmosphere like? Because you, I'm sure most years were pretty safe in terms of your position on the roster, but that can't fully leave you feeling comfortable am i right well cut down day is just weird and i was i was actually telling this story to you know someone um when i was back in albuquerque right by how when i was a rookie you know i gave up a touchdown i had had a good otas great otas had a good training camp good plays in the preseason but for some reason i still didn't feel super safe and then we went out we played the last preseason game and they did two minute drill and I ended up giving up a touchdown. I was, I was playing like the nickel and the slot guy runs, runs a seam down the middle. We were playing two man, so I'm playing underneath and they throw a touchdown. And, you know, for me, I just felt like, Oh my gosh, that was my man. Like he caught a touchdown, like cut day is tomorrow. Like I'm going to get cut because I gave up. Yeah. You know, like I literally felt like that. Um, so cut day is, is stressful. You know, like you said, it's, it's not really stressful in that sense for the guys that, you know, are considered your guys. They kind of know, well, I mean, you either save here or the worst that you feel like maybe could happen is probably be get traded. Um, but it's it's pretty stressful for the, for the young guys. I mean, you just don't know. Right. And you're there. And I mean, like you say they mean they've only been in camp for a couple of weeks, right? They only play one game. So, I mean, what if you didn't get to play that much in the first game, right? Well, you'll look at it and say, well, I didn't get to play that much in the first game. Well, then you, you can't just look there. What did you do during practice to show that you deserve more time to play in the first game? What did you do in OTAs to show that you deserved more time to play? Because if you don't show that you deserve more time to play, then you can't sit here and be like, well, I didn't get to play that much in the game. You, you've you shown us enough in practice to let us know maybe you're not ready for the games, right? So we didn't have all these cuts when I was playing, you know, going from 90 to 85. I think we started with 90 and we went straight to 75. And then the next cuts was down to the 53. So... We didn't have we didn't have all these cuts where they just cutting five guys. Yep. Uh, what what's the point of that? 
that's kind of what I wondered too, is really all it's doing is keeping these players from getting any more film out on them, which is kind of unfortunate because does five extra people on the bus or on the plane really make that much difference for one more week? Right. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what's behind that. I don't, I don't know why they're getting, and you know, maybe that's just, Hey, we all may have five guys that we already consider as, I don't want to say dead weight, but just like, well, all right, we know these guys right here. They're not going to be a part. Like we can get rid of these five and, you know, put more reps on some of the guys that we really want to evaluate and not have to worry about these five these five guys because we already know it's going to be a real long shot for them to make it. And so that's the only thing that I can see. I don't think it – I don't know. Just strange in my opinion. Very. But I'm not Roger Goodell. I don't make the rules. But – I do find it unfortunate that these players were cut before the inter squad practices that are going on right now with the Indianapolis Colts, because a lot of coaches over the last couple of years have said those inner squad practices are actually more telling and revealing than the game, both in terms of evaluating their own players and getting a peek at players on the opposite team and one player who made an impression today for the Colts was Michael Pittman Jr. He was just cooking DBs in the one-on-ones cooking DBs in the 11 on 11s and even getting involved in a little tussle with Jeff Akuda during practice. What do you think about that from CB one coming off from, he wasn't really involved in the play comes in and reignites the flame. Is that the dog you want to see in Jeff Akuda right now coming off the injury? Or is that a play that doesn't need to be made? Well, you know how I am. I, 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 the extracurricular don't matter to me. Yeah. I ain't ain't about being bullied. I I ain't about all that mess. If you want to fight, then we can fight. We could do that too. Cause I'm trying to win every battle coverage fight, whatever you want to do. Um, But at the end of the day, fighting doesn't make you plays. So for Jeff Okuda, I love to see it. I love that he feels like he can, you know, hey, stand up, be a leader, you know, be that guy. But that's not going to, that's not going to win you over Lions fans that want to know, can you live up to the third overall pick? You know, that's not going to, that's not going to win you the starting job for, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to go out and make plays. You got to go out and play the game. So for for somebody, it's like I, I've seen wide receivers cook in one-on-ones, right? Especially when you go to different teams. You know, one-on-ones, offensive drill. Yeah, you get some guys defensively that make plays in one-on-ones, but it's an offensive drill. And wide receivers do the very most in one-on-ones. Like they run routes that they know isn't, a route and they know they can't run that when we're playing real football. Right. Um, so I've seen that happen in one-on-ones, but then you got to shut it down and, 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 and put an end to it when you get to, to team. And so for, for Michael to, you know, come in one-on-ones and then come back and cook in, you know, team, you know, I like to fight, but like, shut him up i don't know if he was talking or you know what i'm saying he's probably if he was having a big day he's probably celebrating and guys get frustrated this and this and that so if you don't want him to talk shut him up and then we don't got to fight that's kind of the balance i've struck with the situation too is i do like the intensity i am happy that he feels confident enough to go up against a guy that's got three inches on him, probably got 20 pounds on him, because Michael Pittman is a massive dude. He gets in fights every year with both his own team, the teams he's practicing against, and in the games themselves. So I'm not surprised by this at all. But as you said, shut him up with your play on the field. He's not going to be talking if he's not catching the ball. So I hope we see a little bit more passes deflected a little bit more lockdown coverage in the game 
just because I don't want Michael Pittman to keep talking. And as a defensive back, I'm sure you feel the same way. Right. And, and, and it goes back to what I said last week. You know, these plays don't just magically happen in the games. Right. If you weren't making plays at practice last week, you're probably not making many plays at practice this week. You probably didn't make many plays in the game. That's just the way it naturally generally works. So they got to do, they, like I said last week, they just got to work harder and take more chances, not just guessing, but trusting your instincts, trusting the system, understanding what the offense is trying to do to you, understanding who's the quarterback and who the receivers are. And you just got to try to go and make a play. So you can teach your body how to go and make a play. And until they do that, it's going to be very difficult for them to just magically make plays in the game. I really like how you keep coming back to that week after week because it's so true and so apparent when you zoom in on someone like Amon Raw St. Brown. I don't know if you were watching Hard Knocks last night, but... In addition to the 202 passes on the jugs machine he catches every day, he's also still working out on the side in addition to what the Lions do with him with his father, John Brown, the former Mr. Universe, who has them training the whole body from the head to the toes. And one of the things he called, one of the players he called out was Kevin Durant saying, there's a reason you have a bad Achilles and it's because when was the last time you did a calf raise? So I don't know if I want to go that far, but I'm also not Mr. Universe. So I feel like he can talk. How do you even get that title? What did he do to get Mr. Universe? I'm interested to know. It's the bodybuilding competition. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like the, the ones Arnold Schwarzenegger used to <laughs> be involved in. He was that kind <laughs> of guy. Oh, okay. Well, man, you know what? Kudos to them, man. It's, I think it's, hey, man, if your dad knows and he wants to train you and you trust him, why not? You, you're putting in work. As long as your body's ready to go, if you feel like doing this right here gives you a better chance to stay healthy throughout the season, be stronger, be faster, be all the things that the Lions need you to be, all the things that you need to be, I'm all for it. Kudos to Dan Quinn. I mean, not Dan Quinn. I don't know why I keep saying that. <laughs> Dan Campbell, um, you know, and his staff for allowing that, right? That's, that's rare, right? Hey on this NFL team, but my dad's going to come work me out while I'm at practice. Like that's rare. So to allow that, that's, that's big time. Um, but he seems like a, he seems like a worker. And as long as you stay that way, you know, you give yourself the best chance to stay healthy, give yourself the best chance to perform at a high level and seem like he got a big chip on his shoulder as well. It really does, because one of the bigger stories that he came up with was draft night sucked for him. He went in the fourth round. He watched 16 receivers go before him. And now he has every wide receiver who was drafted ahead of him memorized almost in. No, not almost. It is literally in anger and out of spite that he keeps this list in his head memorized did you have anything like that with this manufactured chip on your shoulder well yeah i had a chip on my shoulder the whole time and mm -hmm. and i'll tell you why because i went to a smaller school in mississippi so i didn't get recruited really to none of the bigger schools so i went juco so that put a chip on my shoulder then i went to the university of new mexico and we were a good school in the mountain west but we we weren't on the same level as some of the other big schools. And so when when I'm watching the games, because I've looked at the whole draft scout and all those people that the, all the DBs that they got ranked high. Right. I want to watch those guys play because I want to see, are they that good? Are they that much better than me? That's what I wanted to see. So that put a chip on my shoulder. So I'm watching these guys and I'm looking at them on TV. I'm like, man, these guys ain't that much. Better. They ain't that good. Like they're good. But they ain't that good, right? But they're getting all the hype. They're getting all the pub. They go to the school, right? So I just put a bigger chip on my shoulder, right? So then I go to the combine, and then I get to see those guys. I get to stand next to those guys, right? And I'm a fan, right? I love football, but I'm also, like, sizing them up. Why? These are the guys that they got ranked ahead of me. These are the guys that they're saying is better than me. 
So, yes, I had a chip on my shoulder. So when I'm looking at the draft and they take Malcolm Jenkins first as a defensive back, kudos to Malcolm. Not hating on Malcolm Jenkins. Love Malcolm. Had a great career, right? They take Vontae Davis second, right? Not hating on any of those guys. Happy for him, right? Cool. But, you know, and they go on, they take all these other guys, right? Lewis Demons, Darius Butler, you know, Patrick Chung, all these guys, right? All of them. Alfonso Smith, like all these guys are gone. So I'm just sitting there watching, right? And then they finally called my name, right? So for me, yes, yes. Throughout my whole career, I was fans of those guys. We were the same draft class. I was cool with them. But did I have that chip on my shoulder that, like, I want to play better than those guys? Of course. Of course you do. And it should be that way, right? So when I can look up and I get to the tent. 10th year of my career and to see like, man, you know what? I think there was only one defensive back still playing for my draft class when I left. And that was Malcolm Jenkins, right? Kudos to Malcolm. He was the first guy drafted in our class. I think he was the last one standing. Great career. So he did things the right way, but the chip on my shoulder, of course. So for 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 a month, like, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having that chip. If that's what fuels you, that what motivates you, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, I don't be nasty about it. You know, those other guys. I mean, hey man, they didn't draft themselves, so there's no point of hating on the receiver because they got drafted ahead ahead of you. You know what I'm saying? So there's no point of hating on those guys. But there's nothing also wrong with saying, I'm going to make sure that my career is better, right? I'm going to prove, you know what, all these other guys got taken before me by all these teams. The Lions picked me. I want to I wanna make it, I want to prove to the Lions that they made the right choice. And, and go out and live it every single day and work for it every single day. And hopefully we're looking up 10, 12 years from now and we're like, man, he was the one. Out of all those guys that they thought, he was the one. You know, when they go back, you know how they do it every four or five, whatever years, they want to say, oh, let's do a redraft of the 2000 and whatever class. Will they still draft you in the fourth round if they do a redraft? Or will they say, oh, man, this kid right here was actually a second rounder. He was actually a, should have been the first rounder, right? That's Put that chip on your shoulder, man. Do not lose the chip regardless Get a second contract, win it, whatever it is, don't lose that edge. And it sounds like you've still got some of that edge with you, with the names ah, names memorized. But I'm sure it felt pretty damn sweet when you not only dwarfed the entire draft class, but the entire NFL in interceptions. Oh, no question. I mean, like I say, when you got that chip on your shoulder, man, and and you know you're fans of guys but you're also competing right no you're not playing against those guys personally but you're you're always watching from afar right you want to see what the other guys are doing and you want to know what the guys that are in your position that you kind of feel like you stacking up with what are they doing right week in and week out like who's making plays oh man that was a nice play okay man hey we got the sunday night game and i was able to watch a couple games today Hey, man, Harrison Smith was making some plays. I got to go out there and make some plays, right? Hey, man, Earl Thomas made some plays. I got to go make some plays today, right? Nothing wrong with that. It's fun. It makes the game fun. That's what you need to motivate you. Do it, man. I'm all for it. Nothing against it at all. Still be a fan of those guys, though, because like I said, they didn't drop themselves. They didn't do that. So nothing wrong with being a fan of those guys. But I just get fired up thinking about that because that chip, man, that chip on your shoulder is where you just never satisfied. you just never satisfied with whatever it is. You know, I'm not satisfied that I got drafted in the fourth round. I'm not satisfied that I led the league in picks. Is it nice that you can lead the league in picks and show that you can play? Of course, but I'm not satisfied. I want to do it again. That was the biggest thing I used to say when guys have great games, great seasons, great whatever. 
Can you do it again? That's the hardest thing to do is to do it again. The hardest thing. So for me, of course, it was felt great to lead the league in picks. Of course, it felt great to be a pro bowler and all those things. It did. But I wanted to do it again. And I felt like I should have. And I, I didn't get it. So that chip didn't, never left. Even to this day, I still got a chip. And I don't even play. It Just make, me. And it makes sense, too, when you look at Tom Brady, even what he always goes back to is his favorite ring is the next one. The next one. Favorite stat is the next one. Favorite touchdown is the next one. So never let that edge leave because as soon as you let that edge leave, you're opening the door for someone to replace you. No question. No question. The minute you let your guard down, the minute you let your guard down, they're coming like a thief in the night. It just is what it is. You let your guard down and stop guarding your post, they're coming to take it. It just is what it is. So you could be a great player. You let your guard down, stop working, stop putting in everything that you've done, they're coming to take it. I tell my son, People don't get tired of winning. People get tired of doing what it takes to win. People don't get tired of catching 150 passes a season. They get tired of doing what it takes. They get tired of waking up early every morning. They get tired of staying after after practice. They get tired of the work that they got to put in to stay healthy. They get tired of all that stuff. Nobody gets tired of playing a game. Nobody gets tired of scoring touchdowns. Nobody gets tired of catching interceptions. But you lose focus on what you did to be able to do those things. But that's what you get tired of. You look at all the guys that retire. They don't, get, they don't retire because of Sundays. No, you live for Sundays. They retire because Monday is hard. Tuesday is hard. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, everything that I got to do to get ready for Sunday to play at the highest level is hard. And that part, my body needs a break. But if I just get to show up on Sundays, Guys will still be playing today 60 if they could. <laughs> so Glover Quinn playing till he's 60 if he's only allowed or only gets to show up on uh, Sundays. You know, but that's that's the thing about the game. That right there is the thing about the game. Because if you only show up on Sundays, you're not going to play at a high enough level. So you're not going to be able to stick around until 60 because you're not going to be good enough. So that's what gets guys, right? When you can't play at the level that you feel you should play at because you can't prepare at the level or you don't want to prepare at that level, it's time to hang them up. It's time to hang them up. Don't disrespect the game. I always felt that. Don't, don't disrespect the game. And the game won't disrespect you. The minute you start to disrespect the game, it'll disrespect you back. And something from this most recent episode of Hard Knocks that I think really spoke to that was running back coach Deuce Daly. And in private, he's talking with the other coaches and talking about DeAndre Swift and how he has to believe that every time he steps foot on the field, that he is the best player and that no one can hang with him, whether it's running the ball, whether it's as a receiver, whether it's a pass blocker. That's what he's saying in private. But in public, when he's talking to DeAndre Swift, Deuce Staley is getting after him and correcting him and saying, hey, that was a good run. You, you got about 15 there. If you keep that inside just a little bit longer, that's a touchdown. That's an easy touchdown. So what happens? Swift goes back into the game, runs inside for a nice, beautiful seven-yard run, and Staley is thrilled. And so it's cool to see a coach that knows – the talent that he's working with, but still willing to coach him to the extreme and to not let him 
take things off just because the talent is elite. Right. And that, and that's what these young guys don't understand. The absolute best players want to be coached. The absolute best players, they want to be coached. Why? Because you're the coach. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what I can do to get better. It's the it's the guys that think they are the best that don't want to be coached. Come on, coach, man. I got this. I got this. You know what I'm saying? I got this. No, hey man, coach cool, man. He hey man, he let me get away with all types of stuff, man. Like I man, coach just let me. No, man. No. You want a coach that's gonna say, hey man. This is what you should be doing. If you want to be the best, this is what you do. You don't want a coach that's going to let you coast. Why? You want a coach that's going to make you the best. And generally, the best players, they want to be coached. They probably are the best listeners. Right? I guarantee you, Tom Brady probably could coach himself, right? He's been there. I guarantee you, Tom Brady wants to be coached. He wants to be coached. And I guarantee you, he listens. He's probably in there still taking notes, trying to learn something new to this day. The hardest workers are generally your best players. It's the reason why they're the best players. Because they work the hardest. They get coached the hardest. They take notes. They don't ever get satisfied with being good. They don't let being good get in the way of being great. Those are your best players. So to challenge DeAndre Swift, don't be complacent because you're talented. No, man. Keep working. Yes, that was a nice run. But if you have did this, it could have been better. I'm not taking away from it being a nice run. But it could have been better. Get 15 yards, we could have got 30. Right? So I can't let you settle. I can't let you settle. And like I said, the best players don't want you to let them settle. No, because the best players aren't happy just being the best. They want to be better. They want to improve every day. And sometimes that leads to honors like the Pro Bowl and the All-Pro. And other times it leads to a massive contract extension like today, Derwin James Charger safety. He resets the market and to use your favorite term is now the highest paid safety in NFL history until hey, the next safety signs his contract. <laughs> Congrats to him. You know, great player, very versatile player, you know, does some amazing things out there in San I mean, Los Angeles now. All right. You got to lock him up. You can't let him walk. So, like I said, as long as he don't lose that chip, as long as he don't lose that fire, as long as he don't become satisfied just because he got this mega contract, then he's still young. He's going to go out and play well this year and get another one in a couple of years. That's that's really what it is. And so, you know, kudos to him, man. Great player. Um, you know, I, I actually never got a chance to meet him. You know, but watching him from afar, very, 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 very talented guy. Very talented guy. So kudos to him. Great job, Chargers. Paying your players, playing your guys that are your that are your your cornerstone type of guys. And if he can stay healthy, he could be special. And that's one of the things I really admire about the Chargers as an organization is They've nailed their first round pick year after year for a while. We're, we're talking Joey Bosa, Derwin James, Mike Williams has multiple thousand yard seasons. The left tackle that they drafted last year, Rashawn Slater, he was an all pro as a rookie. So the Chargers just take what comes to them in the draft, just take good players and then reward them because Joey Bosa got his extension, Derwin James, Mike Williams, they all get to stay home with the team that drafted them. And that's something I hope that the lions can build going forward with their recent draft classes. Cause 
Aiden Hutchinson, Panay Sewell. Obviously, we've got years left with them, but you never want to lose franchise cornerstones like that. So good on the Chargers for honoring their homegrown talent. Right. And I mean, you know, some talent you just can't deny those guys are absolutely amazing football players. And a lot of times it has to do with the 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 GM and head coach stability, right? Sometimes you get, you know, certain staff or draft a guy and they're good in that system. And then you get another staff because one guy got fired and now this player isn't as good in my system. So uh, I don't know if we want to give him a hundred million dollars because uh so, you know, you let those guys go, you make trades. Um, so shout out to, to to the Chargers for, you know, drafting great in the first round and then rewarding those guys, right? Keeping those young, those young key pieces because you have you have to have those guys. Where you run into trouble at is when you pay all those guys and you know you got Justin Herbert coming down the line. And if you don't have a quarterback in this league, yeah, it's gonna be very tough. So I think Herbert is going into what year three? Uh, yeah, year three. So they're gonna have to pick up his option at the end of this year. So at some point, you know, he's gonna be getting that major bag. Just is what it is. So they can lock up these guys, but they gotta save some room for the quarterback. Got to. Doesn't matter. None of this stuff matters if 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 you don't have a quarterback. None of it. So they got a good young one. And a lot of times teams are very, 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 very successful when they get good first round or good young quarterbacks on rookie deals. When you when you can win, when you can win like that, oh, you're you're doing good because you don't have to pay that quarterback 30, 40 million dollars. And you can get good old linemen. You can get some good D linemen. You can get some good receivers and DBs and linebackers and guys to help you. And you got a good enough young quarterback that can that can lead you to a victory because they can play. The problem happens when you do that, and then you turn into Patrick Mahomes and you're getting you know four hundred whatever million dollar deals. Now you start losing weapons because we just don't have enough money to pay everybody. That's that's where you get in trouble. So hopefully, 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 you know, the Chargers can figure it out. Get all the young superstars paid, and they get rewarded winning some games over there in the AFC. And it really is all about the quarterback even after a great quarterback leaves, because I don't know if you saw the story last week, Jamison Williams, he has switched his Jersey number from 18 to number nine. And of course we all know Matthew Stafford. He is the great number nine for the Detroit lions. And I've heard different sides of this and Jamison Williams. He called up Stafford, got permission and was allowed to wear the Jersey Some fans think it's too soon, whereas other fans love the confidence of Jamison Williams to say, hey, Stafford, I know you did great things in this jersey, but I'm not worried about that. I can live up to it. What's your takeaway? Yeah, I mean, I I don't ever think it's, it's too soon when it's done the right way. Now, and I think that's player wise. And I think that is uh, staff-wise, especially when you got a guy of Stafford's caliber, right? The years and service that he put in for that to that program, right? Like I say, it it looks worse when he leaves, and then you give his number to a tryout punter that. Probably is he's just there as an extra leg because I don't want to wear out the the starting punter's leg in training camp. You know what I'm saying? Like that's when it looks like okay, we're just disrespecting what this man did in number nine, right? Like no, but for it to get passed to the next first rounder, right? The next kid that hopefully is legendary and 
a Lions uniform and for him to have enough respect and humbleness to call Stafford or reach out to Stafford, even though Stafford doesn't even play in Detroit anymore. He just won a Super Bowl with the Rams. For him to have enough respect to get in touch with Stafford and just make sure that, like, it was okay, right? And just to let him know, like, hey, man, I respect what you did. I, I respect your career. I respect what you mean to Detroit, even though you're in L.A. Is it okay if I carry on the legacy of number nine, right? So that's a lot of confidence for for him because he know that the expectations in that number are going to be high, right? And that number are going to be high because of the standard that Calvin Johnson, I mean, not Calvin Johnson, that Matthew Stafford, you know, the standard that he had in that number, you're always going to be held to that standard, right? You know, I remember, and this was, you know, a couple of years ago, right? I remember, you know, when I left, people started hitting me up because they had gave, uh, I think they had signed Justin Coleman um, that offseason and they gave him number 27, right? And I was like, you know, that's cool, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not there anymore. But every time, like, he would mess up or misplays or this, this, and that, I would always get messages of this. Man, you see that kid in 27, man, he shouldn't even, be, you know, but then he would make some nice plays as well. So, you know, you have different people that that feel certain types of ways about it. Um, but for Stafford to put in 12 years there, get drafted there, be the first rounder there, to go through all the ups and the downs and lead those guys to the playoffs multiple times and, like, everything that he did, the numbers, the yards, the wins, the heart, the heart. Like, nine is a respected number around there. Whether he's there or not, it's a respected number. It's the same with 81. It's a respected number around there. So got to be very careful who gets those numbers. You do. You definitely do. And so does it still, having traveled to the Lions, to the Lobos, to your junior college, does it still feel a little bit weird seeing other players in your number, or have you fully accepted it at this point? Oh, I fully accepted it, you know. I just know the standard is high. <laughs> That's all I know. The standard is high. And for me, you know, for people to see number 27 out there in Detroit and to think of me, hey, man, I did I did what I had to do, right? For people to see, you know, number 19 in college and think of me, I mean, what else can I do? You know what I'm saying? Like, what else can I do? So, yeah, I know it's, that number is gonna be gonna be worn because especially in in Detroit, you know, twenty is retired. I think twenty two is retired. So I mean, you lose out on two of those twenty numbers right there. You throw in the running backs. Well, they probably taking you know three or four of those twenty numbers. So as DBs, you don't have many twenty numbers to choose from. I mean, when I got to Detroit, I had to choose between twenty seven and thirty, mm. and I chose twenty seven. So if you remember Darius Slay's rookie year. He was number 30. That's why, because that was the only number left. <laughs> I was 27. He got 30. They drafted him in April. He got number 30, right? And then the next year, Chris Houston left. So then he switched to 23 because the number opened up. But that's that's just how it is. So, um, like I said, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. I didn't go. I didn't even go to Lions practice this year. I'm saying like, who's wearing number 27? I didn't even think anything about it. I was. I wasn't at New Mexico. Like, who's in number 19, man? Like, oh man, y'all gave my number to that guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even think anything about it. Nah, just a number. I tell him all the time. You know what I'm saying? Number don't make me. I make the number. Right. 23 wasn't 23 until Jordan did what he did in it, and now 23 became 23. Right. Those were those those numbers. 80 wasn't 80 until Jerry Rice. And you know, 81 is 81. That's cap like people are gonna say, I mean, I'm that's Calvin Johnson. I want to be number 81, right? I want to be number 21 because of Deion Sanders, right? Like you do great things in the number, and you make the number look great. But just because you were number 21 doesn't mean you're great. 
you gotta you gotta be great. So players players make the numbers. Numbers don't make the players. Players make the numbers, and they make that number by working hard day in, day out, never letting that chip leave their shoulder. And really all of the other lessons that you've left us with, that is how a player makes a jersey, and that's how you get remembered like Glover Quinn in Detroit. So, Glover, thank you again for joining me once again on Believe in Lions. Any pluggables to plug before we head out of here? Oh man, what do I got? What do I got? Um, I don't have anything. Nothing this week. No pluggables that I can think of. No pluggables for Glover other than to follow him over on Instagram, over on Twitter, all the good stuff. Subscribe to the Believe in Lions podcast. Check out our sponsors over at betonline.ag. And until next week, we will see you next time. Peace.